Village Baptist, how are we doing? Good? Good? I, I've had the privilege of growing up in this church, and because I've grown up in this church, so I start off every sermon that way, um, so I'm glad to be in this church. Um, the thing about growing up in this church is that my dad, from the time I was little, all he did was open the Bible and teach it. So I grew up from a little one knowing the difference between truth and error. I, I was young and I was as unsaved as Satan. But I could tell you when I was at another church and sitting there listening to the pastor or whoever's preaching, and I say to myself, what he's saying ain't right. Uh -huh. <laughs> I wasn't even saved. All right. <laughs> and, but I know I wasn't saved. I used to sit in the back of church. Some of y'all might remember. I used to sit in the way back with Jonathan's brother, Willie. Yeah. Y'all remember that? Yeah. And, we, and all we used to do is draw Ninja Turtles. Because I, I was a Ninja Turtle fanatic. And... There was times when even one of our own ministers would be up there talking. I'd be there drawing a Ninja Turtle, and I'd be like, well, he just said that ain't correct. <laughs> and when my daddy get back, he going to get you. <laughs> I mean, I, I just grew up knowing the difference between what's right and what's wrong as it relates to the Scripture. Yeah. And so I'm thankful for that. But that just kind of made me skeptical of any teacher. If it wasn't daddy, I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but as I grew up and started to learn the Bible for myself, I started to get even better at being able to discern truth and discern error. Okay. Now, we're in an age, this church age, I think we're in an age of apostasy. If you don't know what that word means, apostasy is when the people of God turn from what they know to be the truth of God and instead turn to a lie. False teaching and false doctrine. And I think we're in an age like that and a lot of Christians don't know how to discern the difference between what's right and what's wrong. A lot of Christians are turning away from the truth forever passed down to the saints and are now turning to a man-made gospel. There was an evangelist who said that God was using him to heal. And so this couple brought their quadriplegic daughter to him. And he looked at her and he said, if you have faith, you will be healed. So he prayed for her. And after praying for her, he said she'll be healed the next day. So the next day, she was still a quadriplegic. So they brought her back and say, we don't know what happened. She's not healed. That man looked at that girl and said, the reason you're not healed is because you don't have enough faith. Mm -hmm. As the tears welled up in her eyes because she knew, I do have enough faith. I believe God can do this. Why are you telling me that the only way I can be healed is if I muster up enough faith? People leaving from all these crusades disillusioned because somebody told them that if you don't get healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. We're in an age where people don't care about truth anymore. T.I. is a famous rapper, and he just got in trouble for trying to buy machine guns. And somebody was undercover and caught him. So this Sunday, Easter, he was at a church, and he got up. There's like 30,000 people, and he stood up in front of everybody. And this is what he said to them. We're here to celebrate the death of our Lord and Savior. He was willing to give his life for us so that we may ask for forgiveness for our sins and be forgiven and saved, no matter how many times we have to ask or how long it takes to get it right. Now, Jesus died so that you can be forgiven. But T.I. has no intention of turning away from his sin. See, the cross is not something that we look to to only get out of the consequences of sin. If you understand what the cross is, if you understand what it did to Jesus, then you wouldn't want to sin. 
And you wouldn't just say, well, no matter how many times we fall, we're just going to have to keep coming to God. Now, again, you do fall, you do sin, you will have to keep coming. But you have a heart that says, even though I know this is wrong, I'm going to try and turn away from it. That's not T.I.'s heart. And this is what people are saying in the church. Go ahead, sin, do whatever you want because God's going to forgive you. But turning away from truth and now turning to false teaching. Carlton Pearson. Many of you guys may not know, Carlton Pearson is, he was a, a singer, won Dove Awards, Stella Awards, pastor the humongoid church started teaching listen <laughs> he taught that everybody is going to heaven everybody no everybody so there is, so there is no hell so jesus says <laughs> there is a hell Carson pearson says nah and he thinks this is truth. Now listen to what he said. This is hilarious to me. He says, A careful study of what I have taught will reveal that it is entirely scriptural, logical, and theologically sound. That's what he says about his belief that everybody will get saved. I contend that it is not entirely scriptural. <laughs> that it is not logical. And it is not theologically sound at all. You're in an age where people don't care about truth. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you have, in your life, believed some things that were wrong. I know I did when I was young. I, was, I went through phases in my Christian walk. I went, like, I first started off and I was just like, I'm healing everyone. <laughs> so I would just pray for people and I was just, I was filled with the Spirit. I was speaking in tongues. I was being knocked out. I just went this route of just, oh, the Spirit. And then I went this theological route where everything was, has to be in the Bible. And I knew the Greek and I knew the Hebrew and I knew the Aramaic and I knew everything. And <laughs> now I'm balanced now, a little bit. <laughs> but there's this idea in the church that we can just believe whatever we want and that there are no consequences for what we believe. And the church is in a very, very dangerous state because we have Christians who are now following after people. There are people that you even listen to. You don't know that there is some crazy stuff that they believe. So this, for the next couple of weeks, I want us to look at a book that actually gives us some answers to these questions. What about people who are turning away from truth and turning to lies and people who are actually taking the truth of the scriptures and saying you can live any kind of way? Because this is not just a today issue. This is an issue for every day. And that's why the God, God gives us the scriptures so we can say, hey, they dealt with this just like we did. Now we're going to look at it. It's a short book. It's only 25 verses. It's like a little tract in the Bible or a postcard. We're going to look at it. Jude. Book of Jude. Now, there are no chapters, so do not ask me what chapter. Book of Jude. If you know where Revelation is, the end, Jude is to the left. To the left, to the left. Book of Jude, verse 1. You got it? Say yeah. yeah. All right, verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. That's all we're going to deal with today. 
those two verses. So, I want to meet the author of this book. The, the author of this book, his name is? Sue. Sue, you're very <laughs> observant. Now, in the Greek, his name is actually Judas. Now, don't panic. It's not Iscariot. In, in those days, Judas was a very common name. Like John or Sally. You know. It's a very, very common name. So it wasn't, it wasn't weird to have a name Judas. Now, today, we know there's no little Judases running around. At least not in name, all right? So you have <laughs> Ju- Judases and no Jezebel, nothing like that. But in that day, Judas was a very common name. Now, I don't know why the translator decided to say Jude. Maybe they said, we can't have a book of the Bible say Judas. So it changes to Jude. But anyway, Jude introduces himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, something you might not know about Jude is that he was the half-brother of Jesus. Now, think about this. You, most of us, if we know somebody who's famous, We'll make sure everybody else knows that we know that they're fam- that we know them, right? <laughs> it's like with my brother. Anytime anybody mentions college basketball, yeah, you know my uh, my brother, <laughs> my younger brother that I I you know I had a hand in making him. <laughs> you know, I mean, what he is. I mean, there are people who are having conversations about, yeah, did you see a coin? And I'm sitting in the corner at Panda Express, like. My brother, they told me. <laughs> Maybe I should say, I was like, that's my brother. <laughs> I mean, I just wanted them to know Josh Clayton is my brother. I used to beat him up. <laughs> the one you see. I mean, when you know somebody famous, you want people to know. Can you imagine my brother is Jesus the Christ? You have your brother say, what has your brother done? Well, my brother made the walls around Jerusalem. (laughs) She was like, my brother made Saturn. (laughs) And Pluto, ha. What has your brother done? Oh, well, he's in the army. He rides a horse. He's a fastest horse. Ah, my brother made the horse you're riding on. (laughs) I mean, you can't trump. Jesus being your brother? But you does not come out and say, Jesus is my brother. What did you say is, I am a servant. In fact, it literally means bond servant. Or don't even think like waiter. It's like a slave. A slave to his brother. Now, why would he do that? One, because he's probably just a humble person. See, there are some people who know people who are very, very famous, and they won't say anything. Most of you guys probably wouldn't know that Oren, in his day, ran against Deion Sanders. You remember prime time? <laughs> All that dancing won the 49ers a very great championship. Yeah. yeah. Raced him in college and almost beat him. <laughs> almost. <laughs> <laughs> he was close. He was close. <laughs> Order was fast before he got crippled. <laughs> but I, I, I would have. I love Dion. He never mentioned that. There's some people who, who can't wait to tell you who they know, who they got hookups with. Yeah, I know him and I know her. Jude makes no attempt to say, I know Jesus, he's my brother. Instead, he says, I am a servant. Now, what would change Jude's mind? Because you know that his brothers and his sisters didn't believe in him. His own brothers and sisters, his own blood says, you don't believe. My brother, he's the son of God. Yeah, whatever. What would change their mind so that they would actually believe he was the son of God? Only one thing, resurrection. We celebrated that last week. They saw the resurrected Christ, and they said he must be the Son of God. So here we have Jude, or Judas, who says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And for us too, remember, 
you are a servant of Jesus Christ. Because sometimes people talk, as a, and I know, I understand the language, I'm royalty and, you know, God is, I'm with God and I'm his child and all this stuff. And that's true. But you have to remember that you are a servant. You are not worthy to untie one of his flaps on his sandals. A lot of us, I've seen a lot of Christians who are very arrogant about who they are in Christ. I'm with Christ. I'm seated in heavenly places trying to move Jesus off the throne. Scoot over. <laughs> you are a servant. You are low to the ground. Say, what do you want from my life? And that's Jew's heart. Jew's heart is, I don't want to be known as the brother of Jesus. I don't want to get accolades for that. All I want you to know is that I'm a servant of Jesus and I'm a brother of James. Now before we get into this um, excuse this one verse this is one of the only books in the New Testament that doesn't have a recipient. In, so, in other words Ephesians is written to the church at Ephesus um, the book of Thessalonians is written to the church at Thessalonica I don't know how do you say that it's written to a certain group of people, right? This book is not addressed to a certain group of people, but he does say to those, and then he's going to describe them, this book is to everyone, all Christians. And this is what I want us to get. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. When we read the scriptures, we need to read them as God speaking to us. Directly. People say, ah, God doesn't speak to me. Do you read your Bible? Uh -huh. Nah. That's why. <laughs> we, don't, we don't expect God to speak to us. We read the scriptures almost like they're a textbook. It's not a living love letter to us, to a lot of Christians. It needs to be something we are eager to look to because we know God's going to speak to us. Just like in elementary school, my favorite day of the year was February the 14th. Because... Be a king. We worship you. We magnify your name, Jesus. Lift your voice. Valentine's Day. And that was a day where I was going to be sure I was going to get a Valentine from the girl I liked. So I would put our little bags out. We took the bags and we put our name on them. And then everybody would take their little Valentine and they'd go around and they'd put the Valentine in the little bag. And I'd be watching the girls like, yeah, okay. Put that in there. Good. I'd be watching. I'm watching you. And then I'd get home, take the little bag, prancing, get into the, to the playroom, let I laid on my stomach, and you know how you swing your legs like that? And I'm opening all these valentines, hoping to hear, Shola, I love you. I want to marry you. I... But you know what every time I got? Happy Valentine's Day. The end. <laughs> Shola, you are so funny. The end. I never got anything, but you know, I tore through each one of those valentines. I, I just could not wait because I wanted to hear them say something to me. I wanted them to say, I love you. <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> all right? <laughs> I'm working through, I'm, I'm getting prayer and all that. But, <laughs> but you need to look in the scriptures like I was looking at those valentines. God speak to me, and God will. Because Christianity is more than just getting a bunch of facts. It's about having a relationship. Now don't get it twisted, because if our doctrine is bad, then our hearts will also go bad. 
So it needs to be a balance here. So love the Bible, and as we go through this book, I want you to see that this book is written directly to you, and he wants you to take it in and say, this is the Lord speaking directly to me. Y'all follow? All right, let's go. Verse 2. No, I'm sorry, verse 1. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. We're going to take each one of these. Number one, those who have been called. Now, this word called means invited. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> means invited. You have been invited into the kingdom of God. How many of you guys ever went to a party that you were not invited to? <coughs> All right. They call it crashing the party, party hopping, whatever. There is one party that you cannot crash, and that is the kingdom of God. You cannot go if you're not invited. But how many people think, I'm getting into the kingdom of God, I'll invite myself. If you are not invited, called by God, you will not come. And so Jude says, first of all, to those who are called. Now, let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. If you're not a fast turner, it'll be on the um, screen for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8. 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been, what's the word? Oh. Called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You have been called by God. If I hear people tell non-believers all the time that when something wrong goes in their life, oh, God's working it out for your good. No, he's not. <laughs> he's only working it out for the good of those who do what? Oh. Love him, and he'll have been what? Oh. Called. He says you've been predestined. What is it? 30, yeah. And those who predestined before you were even born, God made a decision, I'm going to save her. I'm going to save him. That's what predestination is. So before you were even born, before you did anything good or bad, God decided, I'm saving her. I'm saving him. So then those who he predestined, he also called. And we're going to talk about the call in a minute. And then those he also called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What God begins, he finishes. So he chooses you before you're even born, and he will bring your salvation to completion. Now, what kind of call are we talking about? Because the Bible has many different calls. In fact, there are about 14 passages, but we're only going to look at one. But there is a general call that goes out. When I stand up here and I proclaim, there's a general call for you to come and receive Christ, know Christ, have fellowship with Christ. But then there's another kind of call where the Holy Spirit pulls you in. I'll give you an example. Think of lightning. When lightning hits, it fills the whole sky. Everybody can see it. It's general. There's a difference between that and lightning that makes a beeline straight for your face. difference between lightning all up in the sky and then lightning that comes and hits you. There's a general call. I'm up here saying, come, be saved. Come to the Lord. Come. But some of you are going to hear that and just be like, yeah, whatever. But then some are going to say, I want that. And you're going to be pulled. And only God can decide that. You don't decide that. That's why we worship, because we couldn't have been saved on our own. 
You're not smart enough. How many years did you run around in craziness and doing things that now you look back, you're like, why did I do that? Because you're not smart. I'm included in that too. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not. <laughs> but those who he has called, he's going to bring their salvation to completion. Now write down 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. We're going to look at one of the calls that he does. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It's very familiar to you. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who did what? Oh. Called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. How wonderful is that? The Bible says men love darkness. We love darkness, like roaches. We just love to be in the dark, because nobody can see what we do. At least we think that. But what does Christ do? He pulls us out of the darkness and places us into his wonderful light. And you don't decide that. So Jude writes to us and he says, I'm writing to those people who have been called. God reaches down and he touches your heart in such a way that you can't do anything but believe. And this is a past action. This is something that happened in the past. You were called in the past. Now let us look at the next word here. To those who have been called and then who are loved by God the Father. Love is something that we talk a lot about. You say, God loves everybody. God loves the world. For God so loved the world. And there is truth in that. But I believe that the Lord loves his people in a special way. Differently than the way he loves the world. Now, he does love the people of the world because he allows them to breathe. He allows them to eat, to experience flavor. Everything that he created, he allows them to partake in. But... For those of you guys who are married, you guys love all women, but you love your wife in a specific and special way. All of you have children, well, not all of you, a lot of you have children, and you love your children in a specific way, in a special way. And I think when God looks at us, he loves us, his people. In fact, the Bible says we are the bride of Christ. And so when he looks at us, I don't believe he looks at us the same way he looks at someone who's in hell. That his love is special toward us. And he says, you're loved by God the Father. John 14, verse 23. John 14, verse 23 says, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. I love that. Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit all come to hang out with you. That's a privilege that people in, in the Old Testament did not have. He loves us. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 38, if you're fast. If you're not, just look up on the screen. Romans 8, 38. Familiar passage, verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from what? The love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And he loves you. And we don't need to, you know, when we hear about love, we say, oh yeah, God loves me. Sometimes we need to think, God loves me. Which means he takes interest in me. Now, there's a problem that I had, and I don't have it anymore, but I was tending to think that God is going to love a future version of me. The version of me that reads his Bible more, 
the version of me that prays more, the, the version of me that preaches better. And a lot of us say, well, in five years, God's really going to love me then because I'm going to be all over the street witnessing to every person. Listen, look right at me. God loves you just as much today that he will love you for all of eternity. He can't love you anymore. You can't make God love you anymore. People try to do stuff. Oh, I go to church so God will love me. I read my Bible so God will love me. There's nothing you can do to increase the love of God. He loves you just as much today as he loves you 30 years from now. If you're in him and you follow him, he loves you just as much. So stop trying to do things in order to earn God's love. Some kids never hear their parents say, I love you. So kids go through life trying to prove to their parents, I'm worth your love. You don't have to do that. Coming here will not earn the love of God. Going out and witnessing will not earn you the love of God. Once you are in Christ, he loves you, and there's nothing that can separate you from that love. Nothing. Isaiah chapter 49. Verses 15 to 16. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Those of you guys who have kids, you, I hope you, you don't forget them. But even if you do, God says, I will never forget you. I took care of my little three-month-old cousin. Sort of. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was around. <laughs> but she's three months old, and I get very, very nervous around little babies because I hear about, you know, them sleeping and, and, and dying, what's it called, uh, SIDS. So that whole night, I, I, you know, rocked her and put her in the crib in my sister's room, but I could not sleep. I kept waking up thinking, oh, she alive. I would go back in there, and she'd be spread out, just, just knocked out, enjoying the gift of sleep. And I'm just, okay, so I go back, lay down, and I, I cannot sleep. She probably rolled over, so I go back in the room. She's still over and over and over. Here's somebody I just met three months ago, and I love her more than anything. And God says, I can't forget you. You're engraved on the palms of my hands. You cannot earn the love of God any more than you have now. God loves you, and I'm hammering this because I want us to get this, because a lot of people walk around and they say, I don't know if God loves me because I've messed up. You ever come to church and you can't worship because you know what you did last night? You know what you looked at on the computer? You know what you said? You know what you thought? God can't love you any more than he loves you now because you are in Christ. In Christ. All right, so he loves you. And lastly, you are kept by Jesus Christ. My mom came up to Shantae and looked at her in the face and said, Shantae, where are my keys? Shantae, where are my keys? Shantae, where are my keys? In her hand. <laughs> where are my keys? You ever heard, you heard somebody looking for their glasses? <laughs> Where are my glasses? Right on your head. <laughs> I 
we we lose stuff. We can't find stuff. We're absent minded. <laughs> Jesus will never lose you. Jesus never like, man, where are my kids? <laughs> Where's my child? I'm lost. You can't slip through his finger. Turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I want you to see what Jesus says. John chapter 10, verse 28. John 10, verse 28. I want you to listen to what the Lord says here. Actually, let's go to this verse 27. Look at verse 27. <clears throat> my sheep listen to my voice. Uh-huh. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Question, who's bigger than God? No. Who's stronger than God? No. Okay. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. People say, I'm scared, I'm going to lose my salvation. You are in the grip of God. No sin, no demon, no anything can snatch you out of the hand of God. You're saved, you are secure in him. Kept by Jesus. He ends by saying, Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Why might somebody think, I'll lose my salvation because they sin? But there is mercy, an abundance of mercy. I watch the news. And as I watch the news, I get very, very discouraged because of all the things that I see happening. But even as I watch the news, I have a peace. Because I know God is in control. And that nothing happens that He does not allow to happen. He says, may mercy be yours, may peace be yours, and then love. A love for God. A love for your brothers. Now again, this book of Jude is going to address people who are turned away from the truth and instead turned to a lie. That's what the book is going to address. But Jude wants to start off and say, I want you to know, before we even get into all of that, that you are God's. Salvation is yours and you are secure. And so today we can rejoice in that. So if we look at this book, we're going we're gonna to dive in and see how do we combat these things? How do we look at people who say, you can live any way you want, God will forgive you. How do we combat the idea that people can look at the scriptures and say, that's not what it says, and do something totally opposite? So that's next week. Let's pray.